Hi everyone. I thought I would do an Instagram Live today because, hi, I'm gonna give you all some time to join if anybody's around on a Friday night in June. Hi everybody. Um, the reason I'm doing this Instagram Live is there was a huge story today and I feel like uh, a lot of people don't understand it. It's about something called Forever Chemicals. And here is Gary, hold on, Gary Douglas. He, he was just on the, Gary Douglas was the lawyer in this case. Uh, he represented Stewart, Florida. And um, anyway, it's a really interesting story. Forever chemicals are pretty damn scary. It's in pretty much everything. And the more I learn about it, the more I feel like you all need to be informed about these forever chemicals and what we should know about them and really what we should should do about them. I see a long waited mood. What? You're so weird. People are so weird. Anyway, Gary's going to join us. He just had a huge victory. Uh, 3M, the company 3M, has settled for $10.3 billion with a capital B. That's right. There he Here is. I am. <laughs> Hi. How are you doing, Katie? I'm good. Thank Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. And, um, you know, I just want this story to get a lot of attention. First of all, congratulations on this yeah. huge settlement. Can everyone hear? I hope everyone can hear. And Gary, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Okay, per yeah. perfect. Um, so I know that the news said that 3M has to pay a total of 10.3 billion dollars and this is just the beginning yeah. can you explain you told me it was actually the amount is much more yeah so um 10.3 is actually sort of the present value we call it uh but there will be the payout will actually be to the water systems who are the beneficiaries of this uh, settlement of, of about 12.5 billion dollars over time and i, well, I, get, I get, it, it's broken down in, in a very logical way um, for various reasons, if you want yeah. to get into that. but Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, why don't you tell us, um, this is going to go to water systems all over the country. I mean, maybe start at the beginning, Gary. You represented Stewart, Florida. This was considered, am I right, a bellwether case right. to determine... So um, you know, because there are many, many cities and municipalities that were joined together suing 3M for something called, are they called PFAs or what are they called? So, so the, the chemical at issue is, is, uh, is a family of chemicals called PFAS, P-F-A-S. Um, the primary, it's a large group of man-made chemicals. There are thousands of them and the two primary chemicals that of, of interest that are the, pose the greatest risk of harm to, to people uh, and that are pervasive in the environment. It's, it, they're found in 98% of the world's population. You have it in your blood, you may never have known that till just now. Um, but it's, it's there. Um, and um, the two principal ones, uh, prin principal dangerous ones are PFOA and PFOS. And the EPA has most recently in March of this year issued certain health advisories with respect to safe levels in drinking water. Um, and it, it's, in, it's, it's found in the nation's drinking supply that provides water for about 200 million Americans. And the EPA has determined that there is no safe level. Don't freak out. Nobody should freak out right now. It, it's, a, it's a lifetime health advisory. So that if you drink a certain amount that they have determined as a certain safe level, um, today it's not going to do anything. Um, but it, 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 it's basically a lifetime health advisory. And, the, and it, because it's a forever chemical, as you mentioned, which is sort of a lay term for a chemical that will not de decompose and break down any further in the environment, it stays forever. And when it's absorbed in the human body, mostly through drinking water, and, and as I said, it's found in the drinking water that supplies 200 million Americans, and it's all around the world. Uh, it stays in the body for years. And it is associated with very, very serious, unfortunately, very serious human health effects like various certain cancers. 
it it has it suppresses the natural you you uh, you may uh, immune system you immune, you, you may, you may system I'm having like oranges and oranges and oranges <laughs> um, <laughs> um anyway I don't want to go down that road um but yeah uh so which is a, pertinent because we recently went through a pandemic when you know uh we we needed those vaccines badly and it has a proven um uh, effect a detrimental effect on, on the effectiveness of the yeah. vaccine. yeah yeah let me ask you a couple sort of basic questions gary where they started making these, I did a little homework before we hopped on, and I know they started making these chemicals, I understand, in the 1940s. Yes. Um, so, so tell us what these chemicals are and what are they in? Well, they're in a, a lot of high, uh, household products that we will, we're all familiar with and some that we're not. It was invented in the 40s and, and uh, commercialized by 3M in the 50s. They own a, uh, they owned a patent um, and uh, to, in, for a method to make these chemicals. Um, and they patented this particular chemical, PFOS. They were the only ones, or virtually the only manufacturers in the world for decades. And because it's a forever chemical, it got from these various products. You've, many people have heard of them, like Scotchgard, all these stain-resistant, water-resistant products that are in couches, clothing, boots, umbrellas, um, uh, carpets. Um, it, it has a very low coefficient of friction, meaning it's very, meaning it's very smooth. So it's used to uh, in, for uh, mechanical parts to make them work more efficiently. But the problem is uh, with these particular chemicals, and it's a family of thousands, so they could have used safer versions of this compound, and it's all man-made. Um, it, 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 it's very useful, but it's also, it's also very dangerous. And so it gets from these products, and, and 3M figured this out decades ago, and they knew it was in the human blood uh, of the general population since the 1970s and, and never said anything about it, but it gets from those products into the environment through various ways, uh, one of which is this aqueous film forming foam, uh, firefighting foam, something it looks innocuous, it looks like soap, and it's used for a good purpose to put out very serious fuel kind of fires, but it gets directly into the environment, and as 3M characterizes it, it ends up leaching through the ground into the waterways, our aquifers, and we'll get into our, into our drinking water, and then when we consume it, it gets into our blood. How about the other items you mentioned is it get in through your skin because these aren't products that you ingest right gary right great question um and and 3m um had mapped all this out in diagrams decades ago what what usually happens and there's many ways you can get into the environment one of the most common ways is that folks dispose it's used uh, to another common uh product is to insulate food packaging uh, your McDonald's Big Mac wrapper, your pizza box, they're lined with, with these chemicals to keep things um, uh, warm. Uh, and so when people throw them out and they end up in, a, in, in the municipal okay. landfill, they end up, because they're a forever chemical, the box might disintegrate, but not the PFOS chemistry. And it just sinks into the ground it leaches, that's the word, the scientific word, it leaches, meaning it just travels down through the ground into our aquifers where we get our drinking water from. And then it ends up circulating right back to our household where we threw that pizza box out. And we unknowingly consume it when we pour a glass of water out of our tap. That's Wow, how. it's pretty, it's scary. And and you, uh, uh, you, you mentioned that PFOS can be found in the blood of 98% of all Americans. The and world's in, popular. Yeah, and, and, and in this case, you were representing the water. I mean, yes. who were you representing in Stewart, Florida? Because this is just the first wave of lawsuits right. that have been filed against 3M, and we'll talk about the ones that will come later. But tell me who you were representing in this case. So, so this is a litigation that involves hundreds of water systems 
whether they're municipally owned or privately owned, that supply water to millions of people. And they're all consolidated uh, in one case before one judge, a federal judge, Judge Richard Gergel, uh, in federal court in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And it's all consolidated there. And, and what, what, the, what he does is pick one case that seems to be representative of m the majority of the cases that are filed to get a sense, sort of a test case, to get to a sense of the merits of the case. Uh, and Stewart seemed to be, fit the bill. And the judge picked that case. It's a modest sized city of about 20,000 folks. They have about um, 20 some odd wells that they draw water from and serve their community. Um, and uh, each one of their wells was heavily contaminated with uh, PFOA and PFOS, two of those PFOS chemicals. And it cost millions of dollars. They've spent millions. They spent tens of millions in uh, constructing the uh, equipment that it requires to remove these chemistries from the water to make it safe for their citizens. And um, so this was a test case. We literally settled it on the courthouse steps, which led to this global settlement that will provide funding for hundreds and, ult and ultimately thousands of other water providers uh, who need the money um, to, to, to build the facilities to clean the water. So Stewart, I read, had replaced their wells and you know, did everything they needed to get, do to get these chemicals as best as they could out of the water supply. Have most cities and municipalities done that? Or is there still a lot of these PFAS chemicals and water supplies all across the country? Yeah, so the answer, is, the answer first for Stewart is they, they, they had a lot of trial and error. Um, it wasn't something, you know, water facilities like Stewart and hundreds more like it across the country are professionals. They know how to keep our water clean and they work night and day. They have uh, lab technicians, engineers, scientists. They sample water every day for all kinds of chemistries, but they've never come across anything like PFAS. It's a forever chemical. It is difficult to remove from the water. And they were, along with hundreds of other water suppliers, um, in the last few years grappling with what is the facility, what is the technology that we need to create to get rid of this um, chemical. Um, so they've spent a lot of money to do that. Um, they have been successful. Um, they've, they landed on a, they landed on a, on a particular um, uh, yeah. strategy. Yeah. And um, it's been successful. It will cost millions to operate over the next decades. And again, an important thing is that it's a forever chemical. It's not like you can clean it up and it's going to go. It's going to keep recirculating through the environment. It is literally, it literally rains PFAS because it just stays in the environment and never goes away. Did, did, did 3M know how dangerous this chemical was or these things that they were producing? And did, why didn't they stop? putting people in danger through exposure to these chemicals? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, um, you know what, what I've done this for, for decades. I've started against the to tobacco industry. And, you know, there is such a thing as uh, corporate malfeasance. Um, and, um, yeah, so they knew. They were studying this decades ago. And even in the 1960s, they were doing laboratory experiments on laboratory animals to see the health effects, um, it, and they have um, a, 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 a long history of testing animals um, and finding um, the worst kind of health effects. And, and they knew it was in the blood of the general population. They confirmed that back in 1975, November 6th to be exact, um, when they were able to confirm that every man, woman, and child in America had their compound unique to them that only they made in, in everyone's blood and kept it secret for more than two decades. So have they stopped now? Have they stopped producing these products now? Great question. They, 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 when their little secret uh, uh, that they discovered in 1975, that their, their compound, this product was in everyone's blood, uh, came out, w which is a whole other story 
um, it was sort of by accident to use some of the, the words used by some of the three M witnesses who we took depositions of. It was accidentally discovered by an outside laboratory. And when this um, scientist stumbled on this discovery, it was 1998, and the uh, the lid sort of came off. And they knew that their days were numbered, and they looked to transition, and they announced a so-called voluntary phase out. So they stopped making this particular compound, PFOS, as well as PFOA, in 2002. Yet, all these decades later, it's still in the water. And it's only more recently in the last few years that the United States EPA and the scientific community have finally caught up and, uh, and understood the potential harm that these chemicals pose. And as a result, the EPA, starting in 2016, and more recently this year, have uh, instituted these regulations for what a safe level would be in water, which would be water providers around the country now have to build facilities to remove it to get below those safe levels. Wow. So I'm talking, by the way, to Gary Douglas. He's the founding partner of Douglas and Logan and was the lead trial counsel for the city of Stewart, Florida, one of the cities that filed a lawsuit against 3M that resulted in a settlement of over $12 billion, everyone. So you say this is just the first wave of these so bellwether lawsuits. The next up, Gary, is the one where individuals are coming forward and saying these chemicals made us sick. They caused cancer, they caused autoimmune diseases, they caused all kinds of health problems. And that is going to be the next wave yes. and the next lawsuit. Now, will you use a couple of patients? And just as Stewart, Florida was the test case for cities, will you be using, um, oh, will you be using a, a few patients? Right. right. Well, we call that, you're right, the word is bellwether. Um, yeah, so and Stewart was a, a bellwether for all of the water providers. And just to be clear, the $12 billion is not just for the city of Stewart, it's for all of the water providers um, that have, have cases presently filed and will file in the future. And there will be another round, as you say, for folks that have suffered uh, personal injuries uh, as a result of their exposure. And there are a number of um, uh, health effects that are associated with PFOS exposure, including you mentioned cancer, particularly testicular cancer, kidney cancer, and, and I, other cancers. I think you mentioned liver cancer to me on the phone. Yeah, the EPA recently um, issued a statement where uh, they found based on the latest science, the overwhelming science has established that folks with higher levels of PFOS in their blood have higher rates of liver cancer as well. So the science supports uh, a clear association with liver cancer as well. So we will select a few representative individuals who have levels of PFAS in their blood and a known source of exposure, either through drinking water or whatever, um, and have experienced these health effects. I have a question, Gary. How are they going to prove, you know, cancer is a multifaceted disease for right. you know there are a lot of factors there could be genetic there could be environmental there could right. be all kinds of things how are they going to prove a cause and effect for their particular health issues is there a way that that is done yeah. there is a, a specific methodology as we call it in, in, in law um, uh, and, and there's two parts of it. First, we call it general causation, meaning is it known to cause a particular disease? And yet it is now established that PFAS can cause certain diseases. And then you have an individual who has the disease and has had exposure. And that, so that we call that specific causation, general causation and specific causation. And so what we then have to do is have a, an expert physician, well, the patient's physician, Take a look at that particular patient's other risk factors. As you say, there are other causes for all kinds of cancers. Um, um, testicular cancer is pretty rare. Um, so there are not a lot of other risk factors for it. Um, and, and kidney cancer is not that common as well. And so what you do is you go through this process of elimination. Um, you look at the, the particular patient's medical history and you see if there are any other, uh, any other uh, risk factors that scream out that, well, it could be from smoking 
or it could be from some other known cause. It could be genetic. The, the person's father, uncle, met, uh, aunt, sister had it. Um, and so um, the cases, though, that, that we, that we, the people we represent generally have few of those risk factors. Um, and it, it, it's said that there are so many, um, you know, and there are study, studies out now that look at the overall mortality rates from cancer um, where uh, they analyze folks who have high levels for cancer patients without. And there is a clear signal uh -huh. of an increased rate of these various type of cancers amongst the people with the higher levels of PFAS in their blood. Do you think that, Gary, that it's likely that 3M is going to settle that sort of, uh, that flu of, of lawsuits uh, using, you know, individual patients? Or, I mean, gosh, how, how much more can they pay? That's a lot of money, isn't it? Maybe it's not for a corporation like 3M, but... Yeah, so yeah, good, Grant. Another great question. Uh, you know, Judge Gergel, who um, who is one of the uh, my experience have been doing this a long time, one of the most brilliant jurists I've ever had. He's the guy in Charleston. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he was appointed by uh, uh, by President Obama. Um, a really bright guy. Uh, and I think he, he has said in open court that this represents an existential threat to 3M. Um, but keeping that in mind, the last thing um, we want for our clients is for 3M to ever go out of business. Um, and, and so that is a factor, you know, when we talk about what's a fair settlement. Um, and we do believe that they will have the ability to afford a second round to compensate those folks who have uh, sustained uh, health effects like cancer uh, from PFOS exposure, you know. Keep in mind, no one ever asked, no one ever asked, or gave permission, put it that way, to 3M to have this compound in their blood. All the while for these decades, 3M knowing that it was in everyone's blood. Um, and so that, that's the case in a nutshell. But, you know, we're hopeful, and I think they understand that, that, you know, and to their credit, to 3M's credit, the current ownership and leadership um, understands their responsibility for what took place over the uh, previous decades. And they are committed to compensating water providers in the personal injury cases and so on. Um, and, and, and so, as you mentioned, 3M knew how dangerous this was starting in the mid 70s, correct? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, they were doing experiments where they would expose um, uh, uh, rhesus monkeys, which are very close to their primates like us, um, are commonly used, sad to say, and sacrificed for the betterment of uh, mankind. It, where like 20 out of 24 monkeys exposed to it died wretched deaths. They would expose rats and mice, you know, typical laboratory animals um, who develop tumors and all sorts of organs. And, and they would always explain it away as it's, well, it's unrelated to, to humans, and they, they'd find a way to justify it. Um, and that sort of set back the EPA and the scientific community from ever catching up and understanding. Um, they gave themselves a pretty good head start by not even letting the scientific community, the general public, or the EPA know that, that, that what they knew, which was that it was in everyone's blood for over two decades. So, Gary, Gary, after the patients then sue 3M, um, and I know, I guess your your partner is going to be leading that case, or are you going to be leading that case, Gary? Yeah, so uh, let me put it this way. So uh, my, my firm, Douglas in London, we, we um, this is what we do. We do environmental law. We also uh, have done cases against some of these big, bad pharmaceutical companies and tobacco. That's really where we started. Uh, and uh, so Michael, my partner, Mike London, is the, uh, what, what you call the co-lead appointed by Judge Gurgle to lead the overall litigation. And uh, we like to refer to him as the State Department and I'm the War Department. So when it comes time to try the case, that's what I do. Um, and, and so we will be involved in that way, you know. And um, so my job is to gather the evidence, prosecute the case, and uh, Mike runs the whole 
showed, um, you know. Yeah. When, who keeps when it is this, women. Gary? When is this on the docket with all the patients and all the 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 victims? So there might be one more, a water provider, um, case. We're working on that because 3M is not the only company that made aqueous foam forming foam that contains these dangerous chemicals. There are others that have not settled. Um, and uh, so there might be one or two more that involve these other companies uh, before we do the personal injury cases. As far as the personal injury cases, to answer your question, um, so we're in the process of selecting those representative plaintiffs. Mm -hmm. And then from that, a one will be picked as the first trial and that probably happened within the next year or so and and you mentioned on the phone if i'm not mistaken that there's going to be a third wave of lawsuits right gary what yeah. will those involve and what will those entail yeah so those involve um individual states who brought claims uh through their attorney generals we call those the ag cases on behalf of states and their claims have to do with natural resources every state um, you know, has its natural resources, its rivers, its parks, the, the wildlife, the fish, the deer, um, and, um, and those have value. Um, and, and so when you go out um, and exercise the Second Amendment right to go hunting, for example, and you can't eat the deer because it's filled with PFAS, or you can't um, eat the fish from the stream because it's contaminated with PFAS, that's a damage to the state. That's the state's natural resources. And so that's the third category of claims. Let me just end this by asking you what the average person can do, because this sort of scares the bejesus out of people thinking that they have these chemicals they do in their bloodstream or in their bodies and, and uh, that they're there forever. So I guess I have three questions, I think. How do you know if you have dangerous levels of these chemicals in your bloodstream, how do you know if your water supply has dangerous levels of, of these chemicals? And, uh, you know, is there anything more that can be done to remove them from our water supply and from other things? I, I'm assuming they're not being used on our pizza boxes, as you said, or McDonald's isn't using this to keep yeah. things warm anymore. But I guess the, my bottom line question, Gary, is how can people protect themselves? Yeah, so yeah, the, the, they are no longer, these longer, the PFOA and PFOS, they, they call those longer chains. Um, without getting into the nerdy science on this, um, those are the more dangerous ones. And they stopped using those years ago and using a shorter chain, PFOS. It's still part of the PFOS family. It's not completely safe, but it's far safer. It doesn't stay in your body for years. It, it'll stay in your body for weeks or months. And the longer something kicks around, the more opportunity for something to go wrong. So they are. So what they use now and what they use today is safer. Um, but you, and, you call them forever chemicals, so the bad ones that they stopped using never leave, right? Yeah. So they do. So uh, when they're in the even, so they have half lives of about five years. So if you stop consuming PFOA, PFOA it will eventually leave your body. And I don't want to panic everybody. Nobody, it's not everybody. It, it, most folks, unless they live in a community that is heavily contaminated, have nothing, likely have nothing to worry about. You know, I mean, the science is still out, so we're all concerned and nobody wants to have anything in their body that shouldn't be there. Um, but um, if you really want to protect yourself, it's always, you can buy filters uh, for your water. You can ask your local water provider to, uh, 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 if they've tested. If they are over levels, you would have gotten a notice. So if you haven't gotten a notice, you're probably okay. Um, if you have a private well, you can have it tested. Um, but um, you can go out and invest in a relatively inexpensive water filter that you can put in, in your house to make sure the PFAS is removed. And then you just change the filter. Um, if you know that. You talk about communities. I mean, they're communities, 200 million people. Are these more rural communities? Are they, is this, does this chemical exist, you know, less in urban areas? I'm just curious. And how can you find out if your community is one of those communities that was involved in this class action lawsuit, I'm assuming, right? 
Yeah, so um, the, 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 community, the, the, the water systems that tend to be, uh, have higher levels are those that are um, historically adjacent or near to a military facility because the military used aqueous film forming foam. Um, and, and that is by far the primary source of PFAS in, 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 in the environment. Um, so it, if your water system that provides you water is close by uh, historically to a military facility, or you know that your local fire department used at least full forming foam, and 90% of that is used in training exercises, um, then yeah, you might, you're at higher risk. Um, uh, it, it, and in most communities, it, it is at very lower levels. When I say 200 million Americans are consuming it, um, the vast majority are, are presently at levels below which the EPA is set as the safe level. Um, but if you're in a le an area that you know is adjacent to a military facility, a f uh, an airport, also, airports also use them, um, then you might want to inquire of your uh, local water provider. But if you haven't received an, a notice from them, they're required to provide you notice if they go over a safe level, then you're probably okay. Is there a place online you can go and sort of check your local water supply or anything that you know yeah, of? Pretty easy to Google. Um, there are organizations that, that literally have maps. So if you just Google, is my local water company contaminated with PFAS or find any combination like that, you'll find a plethora of sources online to, to, that will uh, help you identify uh, your local water provider. When we talked earlier, you said you were happy that this settlement has gotten a lot of attention, but disappointed that this story wasn't covered more thoroughly by the media yeah. through the years. Um, has it got, it, obviously it's gotten some coverage, uh, yeah. but can you, can you expand on that and what, what you meant by that? Well, I guess, you know, this is the largest um, settlement in the history of America for water provider contamination, twelve and a half billion dollars, and then we also settled for a billion one with uh, Dupont. Um, so the sheer numbers sort of got the headlines, um, but there's an underlying story that I gave you talked a little bit about, is in terms of what 3M knew and when they knew it, and what they did in in in, in regard to what they knew and how the story um, was kept within company walls for so many decades. I mean, they would literally talk about it over the water cooler in the company, uh, close company confines about how they knew that it was in everyone's blood, but they never told anybody. And, you know, and it's, it's sort of a, a really sad and tragic story of, uh, you know, some would say the worst case of corporate malfeasance, perhaps next to tobacco. Um, and so that's sort of part of the story is getting overlooked just because of the sheer number. But it is important. I want to make this clear that we're happy that we've gotten the funds to help clean up the water because that is the source of the contamination. We want to cut it off, cut it off at the source. We want to clean the water so that folks can recover and our level, the levels in everyone's blood can start to go down and the risk of health effects will diminish and eventually go away. Well, it's an important and fascinating story. You're so nice, Gary, to hop on this and help us understand. Sure. I'd love to interview maybe some of the plaintiffs who will be involved in the next case uh, sure. to talk to them about it. Because I do wonder, like, you know, and this, this, this is, I guess, my skepticism as a journalist. Will some people just jump on this bandwagon or will there be, as you said, is is very specific, what did you say, general causation and specific causation right. that will really illustrate that that this is why this person got sick? Yeah. Jumping on the jan bandwagon, um, yeah, there's plenty of those, you know, um, our firm prides ourselves in being, being very careful about um, uh, uh, screening the folks that just want to get a, a free ride. Um, I mean, we're serious about what we do. Our goal is to provide, is to help 
level the playing field for regular folks or for water providers and to make sure that everyone has, everyone has a right to cl good, clean, safe water. That, that's what we do. Um, so, yeah, we, we don't, we're not interested in the people that want to ride the bandwagon and get a check. And, and, and what's interesting is the science bears this out, which is fascinating, too. So it would be interesting to talk to some of those folks and to find out how it was determined that, that these chemicals that 3M knew were dangerous actually resulted in very serious illness for, for many of these individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and they still deny it to this day. If you go onto 3M's website, they will they will deny the, uh, what what is what is the general consensus, the overwhelming general consensus of the scientific community. If you go on their website right now, you will hear you will see that that they their position is that these chemicals at the levels found in in, in the general population pose absolutely no risk whatsoever to human health, even though that's contrary to the overwhelming scientific consensus today and the United States EPA. And real quickly before we go, how long does somebody asked it in the question section, how long does 3M have before, you know, to, to pay this settlement? Is this an, an immediate yeah. settlement? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's structured over time. Um, a, a payment will be made uh, next year. Um, for the cases that are currently found to have uh, PFAS, we call it HITS, um, in, in their water. Um, and the government is requiring water providers to test again within, I think it's the next year, it's called the UCMR5. Water providers with greater, that serve greater than 3,300 uh, customers are required to test their water for a number of compounds, including PFAS. And for those future cases, uh, there's a separate amount of money that's going to be set aside that would begin to be paid out in 2027 uh, through 2030. All right. Well, and, and do you think that this could bankrupt 3M? No. Um, and that's the last thing, as I said, we want to do. Um, you know, and we, we worked hard, my partner worked hard with his colleagues, um, Scott Summey and Paul Napoli, in putting together the structure of this. It was a very, very complicated deal um to put together because there's so many variables and and to do it in such a way as as to not bankrupt 3m you know um their capital their cap value their market value is 55 billion dollars and this settlement's 12.5 you know that's a significant percentage of their over overall value and they know they're still going to have to face these personal injury cases and their state ag cases so it, it's a very tough pill for 3M to swallow, but not, not going to put them out of business. All right. Well, Gary, I hope I get to meet you one of these days. Thank you again for explaining this case and, sure. and uh, for the great work. As you mentioned, it's the biggest settlement other than the tobacco industry in U.S. history. Is that right? Well, it's the biggest for, 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 for water, water contamination. For water contamination. Without a doubt. Yeah. Anyway, By far. Wait, listen, have a good weekend. You Thanks. deserve it. Yeah, I'm going to chill out now. Okay, good. All right. Thanks All right. so much, Gary. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. All right. Appreciate take it. care. Bye. All right. Take care now.